Okay, good morning af everybody, or good afternoon actually, looking at the clock. So let's talk about sexual attraction and love, uh, our last uh, lecture of the semester. And so uh, the outline for today, there we go, got my pen. Uh, we'll be talking about evolutionary psychology, that is I'll review uh, what we've talked about before. Then I'll build on it by talking about reproductive strategies based on uh, evolutionary psychology. How should or what strategies would be the most adaptive uh, for people to have in terms of reproduction? And then we'll need to come back and revisit that again. Uh, once we have that under our belts, uh, we can move on to experimental evolutionary psychology and talk about some of the findings they found in terms of uh, interpersonal relationships and sexual relationships. Uh, a rhetorical question, and rhetorical of course means for the sake of learning, uh, why do men love big breasts? And uh, I'll give you a couple different answers to that. Uh, and then finally a couple special topics. Uh, man seeking man, woman seeking woman, uh, same sex behavior, and then finally end up talking about the gender spectrum. So let's just now review uh, evolutionary psychology. And remember, I introduced evolutionary psychology to you at the beginning of the semester and actually the first day of the semester uh, you know, with these three principles. The first principle is that the brain is a physical system. Uh, there's no metaphysical aspect to the brain. Uh, it's just basically neurons and uh, chemicals and electrical impulses. Principle number two, those neurocircuits were designed by natural selection to solve problems that our ancestors faced during our species evolutionary history. That is, as our body physiology uh, was designed by natural selection forces uh, to adapt to the environment, uh, the neurocircuits that control our behavior were, uh, you know, designed or naturally selected by the environment uh, based on what behaviors would allow us to adapt to the environment the uh, best. And principles uh, n uh, number three, different neurocircuits, or sometimes we'll call them modules, are specialized for solving different adaptive problems. And so these are the uh, three basic principles of evolutionary psychology. And then continuing our review, I talked about fixed action patterns uh, or FAPs. These are motor programs that are hardwired. Uh, that is, these motor uh, programs are a repertoire of stereotype movements. So uh, once this program is activated, uh, organisms will go through a series of movements. Uh, you know, why are they doing that? In response to the stimulus. Uh, so we understand that uh, this is caused by, these behaviors are caused by, excuse me, uh, these behaviors are caused by uh, the neuro uh, you know, module uh, that was triggered by some type of stimulus. Uh, the behaviors are characteristic of a species and their structural features. Uh, that is, these different modules are species specific and based on adaption, ado adaption to uh, different problems. And I said that something uh, triggers it. We call that a trigger or a sign stimulus. Uh, there's a stimulus that elicits the fixed action pattern. Uh, so in some fish, when they see a red belly, that uh, elicits the fixed action pattern of attacking. And the attack, of course, is a motor program that is it's a repertoire of stereotype behaviors. Move forward, open your mouth, and uh, you know, close it. And so let's now begin to build on the basics. Uh, so what this has to do with attraction and uh, sexual behavior is that sexy is a sign stimulus. That is what we consider to be sexy, the uh, you know, uh, 
uh, you know, stimuli associated with seeing or feeling or smelling other people uh, is a sign stimulus that triggers a module uh, which results in a fixed action pattern. And that fixed action pattern is attraction. So sexy is the sign stimulus that is sexy, uh, what we consider anything to be sexy, and we'll get to that specifically in a minute. That's the stimulus. Uh, the module processes that and then begins a fixed action pattern. And that fixed action pattern uh, in general is attraction. We could call that attraction. That is, uh, you know, elements that cause people to be focused on something. Uh, to find looking at that or touching that or smelling that, uh, you know, uh, a positive uh, event. So that is the fixed action pattern. So sexy, uh, what we consider sexy is the sign stimulus. Uh, and then uh, the feelings of attraction, the behavior associated with the attraction, that is looking, checking somebody out. Okay, so that was a basic description of, you know, the basic theory of evolutionary psychology and bringing it into the area of, uh, you know, sexual uh, attraction and sexual behavior. Uh, now let's move to a little more advanced topic, uh, which is reproductive strategies. Reproductive strategies are, of course, as the name implies, the strategies that uh, organisms, you know, species choose uh, to reproduce. And that's based on uh, the different contingencies of the environment and the situation uh, and what's most adaptive to those uh, contingencies. Uh, however, uh, to understand or evaluate the successfulness of these strategies, we need to think about grandchildren. Uh, grandchildren are the uh, real measure of a successful strategy. You can't look at whether or not you reproduce as a successful strategy because in some cases just having children is not enough. Uh, a very biological example would be mules. Mules are the uh, offspring of horses and donkeys. Uh, and so when a horse and a donkey have sex with each other, they produce a mule, or could produce a mule. And you could say, well, they successfully reproduced. Not really. Mules are sterile. So uh, any type of uh, gene that would uh, have a horse and a donkey uh, being attracted to each other uh, would not get into the gene pool that way. Uh, because the, you know, if say a horse and a donkey both had some type of genetic mutation where they had a fixed action pattern where uh, they saw each other as a sign stimulus of sexual attraction and they'd have sex with each other, they'd produce a mule. The mule would have the genes that would, uh, you know, dictate being attracted to each other. But then the mule, because it could not have children, could not pass those genes on to future generations, and so those genes would die off. And so this is, you know, an example of how grandchildren are the measure of reproductive success. Likewise, we can think of human beings. Uh, human beings could do something to have, you know, could have some type of reproductive strategy to have children. Uh, but let's say that you have a reproductive strategy of you produce children and then you immediately kill them. Uh, that uh, would mean that then uh, the genes to engage in that reproductive behavior would not get into the gene pool. So that would be uh, you know, a situation where you could reproduce, but it would not be a re uh, productive reproduction, reproductive strategy or a successful one. So that's what reproductive strategies are. That's our measure of why they're successful. So let me ask you a question. Uh, I have here two reproductive strategies, two general reproductive strategies. I'm using babies here, so we're talking about people. Uh, so which strategy, number one or number two, do you think is the best reproductive strategy for human beings? 
Uh, one is you have the strategy of creating a lot of babies. Uh, and so many babies that you can't take care of all of them yourself, and so you hope the other parent will uh, rear them. So that's one reproductive strategy, the love them and leave them uh, strategy. And then there's another strategy. Uh, you have a few babies, and since you only have a few babies, uh, you're going to make sure that they have the best chance of growing and having children themselves, that is the grandchildren. And so what you do is you uh, devote a lot of time and energy to the babies. That's why you only have a few because you only have limited resources. But also to make sure that uh, you're doing the best for the few children you have, you make sure that they have the best genes possible from the other parent. And so what you do uh, is you look for uh, partners who have really good genes. And so we can call this the uh, putting your eggs in one basket. Uh, you know, uh, strategy. So which strategy do you think is the best for human beings? Take a minute to think about it. Stop the, uh, uh, you know, video and think. Maybe if you've thought about it, you realize that perhaps both of these strategies are good. However, they're not good for both genders. And that's because no, oh, a superfluous slide. Uh, that's because uh, you know there are different biological constraints on the number of children you can have. Uh, this is a you know, list of world records for having children. Genghis Khan, 1,000 to 2,000 children he fathered. It is estimated. Number two on the list is Ishmael Ibn uh, Sharif. 867 children. Augustus II, the strong, uh, somewhere in the upper 300s. And those are the men. And then the minute we switch over to the women, we see uh, you know, a major difference. Uh, Valentina uh, Vasilyeva, uh, she is the world record holder at 96 children. Uh, someone known as Mrs. Gravata, 62 and Yaakov Krilov, 57. Uh, we see that in general men can have a large number of uh, children or offsprings. Women uh, at the high end of the distribution uh, are limited compared to men. And so as we go back to our two different reproductive strategies, because men can have a lot of offspring, uh, they can use the first uh, method I talked about, or the first strategy. Uh, they know they can't take care of all of them, but they hope that the other parent, the mother, will. And given you know mother's usual attachment to babies, uh, you know this uh, you know is an adaptive reproductive strategy for men. Uh, and so then. I ask you, and I'll can ask you another question like this for women in just a second, what is important in a mate uh, for this strategy? That is, if you're a man and you're using this strategy, what are you going to look for in a mate? What are you going to look for in a woman? And that will be a sign stimulus of what is sexy, because sexy means you're attracted to them. Attraction may lead to intercourse. And that's how the evolutionary psychology works, or the uh, reproduction works. Uh, people are not planning things. Uh, evolutionary psychology is essentially programming organisms to have these fixed action patterns, and through the process of uh, you know evolution, uh, the more appropriate uh, reproductive strategies are being uh, you know, uh, you know, left in the gene pool, and the less appropriate reproductive strategies are being called out of the rep of the gene pool. So, in this case, what is the important uh, you know uh, things in a mate for this strategy for men? What are men looking for in women? And then, for women. Uh, because they can only have a few babies, the second reproductive strategy is the best. 
That is, women uh, want to have a fewer number of babies, and they want to make sure that each baby has the best chance of going and having children themselves. Uh, so they're going to have a few number of babies, which will allow them to put a lot of energy into raising those babies. Uh, they are looking for partners who have good genes, so uh, you know their children will have 50% of their genes and 50% of their partner's genes. So that other 50% of their genes, they want them to be the best possible. So what would be an important uh, you know a thing to look for in a mate using this strategy? That is, what would women find sexy uh, in men? Because again. Uh, sexy is the sign stimulus, so they see something sexy that leads to attraction that may lead to mating. Uh, and so, uh, if uh, the women, uh, if that's a successful reproductive strategy, then that module that relates that sign stimulus to attraction will be left in the gene pool, and it will probably then spread out through the gene pool and uh, be a very common strategy for all women. So to answer those questions, men's reproductive success based on their strategy is going to be improved by choosing a mate who seems youthful, healthy, and fertile. Uh, that is, the women will need to give birth, which will be an arduous physical process, and they will have to, you know, be able to rear the children. So therefore, they're looking for women who are fertile, because if you're going to have sex with someone, they should be fertile. So they're looking for signs that the woman is fertile. So again, the sign stimuli are things that indicate the woman is fertile, because sign stimuli will cause attraction which may cause sexual activity. Uh, then also, uh, you're looking for women who are youthful, uh, who will be around for a while to rear the children, make sure they grow up and get married and have grandchildren. And of course, being healthy will help them rear the children and whoop, whoop, survive giving birth to the children. So men's reproductive success uh, is improved by choosing a mate who seems youthful, healthy, and fertile. And so these will be the sign stimuli, uh, things that indicate the woman is youthful, healthy, and fertile. Women, on the other hand, their reproductive success is improved by choosing a mate who has good genes because the children will have one half of their genes will be from the father and the better the genes from the father, the better uh, the uh, genes that the child will have. Of course, I'm using this term good genes. What I'm talking about is uh, genes that are more adaptive to the environment. Uh, genes that allow you not only to survive in the environment, but also to uh, overcome and to uh, be a leader in the environment. So again, Think about this in terms of reproductive success, more grandchildren. Uh, and let's clear this up so I can re review. No, go back. Let me have my pen. Thank you. Oh, go back. There we go. Uh, so reproductive success is more grandchildren. Uh, so men will take the numbers approach and they will just look for women who are healthy, uh, youthful, and fertile. They will try to have uh, you, know, uh, you know, intercourse with as many women as possible. And some will give birth, and they will hopefully rear their children, and those children will be taken care of, and probably will grow up to have children themselves. If the children don't, that is no problem for the male's reproductive strategy because the male will be trying to have as many children as possible from different partners. And so if that one partner is unable to rear the children to ensure they grow up well and have grandchildren, then somebody else will. 
and that is the uh, evolutionary psychology or the evolutionary biology of that. Uh, women, they choose to put all their eggs in one basket. Uh, there's a pun there, of course. And so uh, what they're doing is they're making sure that the few children that they have, all of them are going to be probably likely to grow up healthy and have children themselves that is grandchildren. And so they're going to ensure that those few children grow up to have grandchildren by making sure that they have the best genes possible so that they will not only succeed but they will dominate in any t situation that they're in and will easily succeed and prosper and then the mothers will also focus their energy for the rest of their lives on making sure that their children grow up healthy and get married or have uh, partners and have grandchildren. And again, both of these strategies lead to reproductive success, that is, more grandchildren. And that's the end of part one, and we'll move on to more reproductive strategies uh, in part two.